Okay, good morning and welcome to this very exciting session C of ESCO. Uh, my name is Marianne Dunn. I head the Capital Stocks and Tangibles and Infrastructure Branch at the Office for National Statistics and I will be chairing the session today. Uh, I just want to go through some uh, practicalities before we start. Each presenter has 20 minutes to present and at the end, five minutes before the end, I will come in and notify them. And there will be 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Uh, although we cannot ask the questions directly during the presentations, uh, by all means, please feel free to submit your questions uh, on the Q&A function of Zoom. So I would like to get started. Uh, first of all, the first session is by Peter Vanderven from the OECD. Uh, he will be talking to us about the importance and the international uh, aspect of infrastructure, the challenges we face, and he will also uh, be uh, talking to us a little bit about the wider plans. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Marianti. Uh, I will start uh, sharing my screen. So it it worked when okay getting it you you can see it now right okay uh well yes for for those of you uh, who do not know me uh i'm peter van der ven uh head of national accounts at the at the OECD. Uh, before that, I worked at uh, Statistics Netherlands uh, for quite a while. Um, I will make a short presentation on uh, what we call at the OECD a horizontal project uh, on sustainable uh, uh, infrastructure. Horizontal project means that we involve specialists from various areas to work together on, on some projects. We have, for example, a horizontal project on going digital to look at the digitalization uh, of the economy. We have one on uh, housing, uh, et cetera. So these, usually these horizontal projects are quite massive. Uh, uh, lots of people are involved. So perhaps uh, uh, as a start, I should apologize beforehand if I'm not able to answer more detailed questions on uh, all the content of this uh, horizontal project. Uh, Keeping fully updated would require lots of time. Uh, and uh, I'm mainly involved in the statistical part of this project. Actually, uh, Marianti uh, is representing uh, the OECD uh, Committee for Statistics and Statistical Policy in the steering committee of this uh, horizontal project. So it's very nice to see Marianti again uh, during this uh, webinar. So what, 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 we, what we see that is that, that infrastructure uh, meets various challenges. And as the OECD, we've looked how, how can we respond uh, to these uh, challenges. Uh, uh, what we see is that in many countries, infrastructure investment is far below what's needed for, for growth and, and, and other global ch uh, challenges. It, infrastructure projects are very complex, uh, long term by nature, and uh, involve very uh, numerous risk and stakeholders. For and it's it's uh, perhaps also one of the goals of the project is to see how to involve also private parties in uh, financing, for example, uh, infrastructure. And. Uh, we, we firmly believe that also when talking about infrastructure, you need to go because, uh, beyond the traditional siloed approach. Uh, obviously, uh, the term sustainable infrastructure also tells a story in that respect. Uh, it, it's not only about, uh, let's say, uh, transport infrastructure and how to move people around, it's also about looking at a sustainable <coughs> way of, of uh, infrastructure, etc. So we have this uh, cross-cutting, multidisciplinary and coordinated response. Uh, 
uh, with, with the goal the, to, 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 to have strategic policies for sustainable uh, uh, infrastructure and make sure that infrastructure meets this multi-dimensional aspects of economy, environment, social and development uh, ob ob uh, objectives. And we try to address these emerging challenges and issues. There are actually more than 100 projects and activities. Uh, please be assured I will not tell uh, about all of them. That would take probably a couple of hours. But here you have some of the, of the, the main topics or, or parts uh, within this horizontal project. It's about uh, how to arrive at low carbon transition and adaptation resilience, looking at, at uh, cities, uh, regional disparities, but also uh, about uh, governance and decision making and how to mobilize finance, uh, both public and private finance for developing infrastructure uh, projects. So there's a lot of uh, topics uh, involved. Looking at, uh, at the key deliverables, uh, at least for, for 2020, uh, in July 2020, we had a new OECD recommendation on the governance of infrastructure. You, you can understand that's quite, these are massive projects, very, very large projects involving a long time, uh, requiring very, very substantial uh, amounts of uh, finance, and governance is very critical in, in developing infrastructure. So this new OECD recommendation is a, is a tool, kind of a tool for, uh, to assist governments uh, to invest in infrastructure pro uh, projects, which are cost effective, affordable, and trusted by uh, all uh, people uh, in the society. In October 2020, we, we, we have scheduled to, uh, to disseminate the compendium of good practices for quality infrastructure. So it's basically uh, uh, bringing together existing good practices across OSB committees uh, to support the implementation of, of uh, quality infrastructure. It's basically uh, sh showcasing and share an experience on, on how to do this in, in, in a good way. At the end of the year, uh, the, there's a uh, major deliverable uh, in uh, an implementation uh, handbook on delivering quality uh, infrastructure. It, it provides uh, guidance on, on delivering uh, this uh, infrastructure with case studies and examples. Uh, perhaps a couple of words on, on this OECD compendium that's forthcoming in October. What I already said is a compilation and consolidation and distillation of the collective knowledge uh, at the OECD, in the OECD countries on quality uh, infrastructure. It has more than uh, 340 good practices and measures it draws uh, on a wide range of uh, OECD standards and guidance, and it represents uh, actually the work of 20 OECD uh, committees and, and their subsidiary bodies. So there's a lot of people involved in bringing all of this uh, together. It's also aligned with the G20 principles for quality infrastructure uh, investment. Some other deliverables and other work. We have a uh, working paper on do sound infrastructure governance and regulation affect productivity growth. New insights from firm level data. Uh, obviously, that, that is one of the objectives to, to, uh, to, to that uh, uh, infrastructure is instrumental to future uh, economic growth. There's also uh, a report, a G20 OECD report on the collaboration with institutional investors and asset managers and investor proposals on the way forward. 
here, here you see the importance of, of financing and how to finance and how to involve uh, both public and private parties in the financing uh, of, of uh, infrastructure. Uh, we also do uh, infrastructure governance uh, reviews. Uh, we did one in, in Argentina in May, and there's one for Spain uh, forthcoming, where we look into how uh, infrastructure projects are governed uh, in the countries and provide, uh, uh, yeah, let's say an assessment of how is that done and how it can be improved. There are also various notes on infrastructure in light of the COVID-19 developments. And I suggest uh, you, you go to the link uh, in, this, uh, especially to, to, in this presentation to see what is being written uh, down there. So, and now I come uh, to the direct involvement uh, of, of statistics. And I, I would say that, that there are three uh, lines of work in which we are involved at the Statistics and Data Directorate, and therefore implicitly also, let's say, the, the, the countries uh, represented in the Committee on Statistics and Statistical Policy. And the first one is about defining infrastructure. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure, I don't think any of us has, has uh, the, the same thing in, in mind. Uh, and if, if you want to provide governance, if you want to provide uh, uh, policy advice, etc., uh, you want to, to collect information, you need a proper definition. Also for the compilation of international comparable statistics at macro level, so you can uh, look at past uh, uh, developments or can you uh, to, to compare countries. Um, we, we will draft such a uh, uh, definition or make a proposal for such a definition in, 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 the, in the course of, of this year, the remaining part of the year. Uh, it will be a two or three pager in which we make a proposal for a definition. Um, it's important, uh, well, we often when people talk about uh, infrastructure, they think of uh, trains, railways, uh, etc. So it's often very transport re related, but you can also have uh, broader definitions. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, also including IT related infrastructure. And I think it's quite logical to to include that as well, because it's of growing importance for, for uh, the economy, but you can also think of energy related infrastructure and or other types of infra infrastructure. Some, some actually have very, very broad uh, definitions of infrastructure. Uh, they include also, let's say, uh, uh, hospitals and schools, etc. So don't know. I, I personally, but that's our only first uh, thoughts. I, I would not go that far, uh, but probably it, it would be wise to, to at least have IT related and energy related infrastructure included. A second uh, line of work is collecting available national data on investments in infrastructure. Uh, actually, the starting point for that is the national accounts questionnaires that uh, by which we collect data from, from uh, countries. But if you look at, at the questionnaires, the national accounts questionnaires, at uh, the data we ask on investments and capital stocks of uh, um, uh, fixed assets, of, uh, then you see that the breakdown does not, does not uh, how to say, it is in line with uh, the request you have in relation to infrastructure. Uh, you have one big category, it's called uh, buildings and other structures for which we collect data uh, on, on investments and uh, capital stocks. This is only broken down uh, into dwellings and the rest. And the rest is a big, big uh, well, pu pulling together a lot of various types of investments. And a couple of years ago, we 
ask countries to provide us with more detailed data if uh, available nationally. Fortunately, a significant number of countries could break uh, this uh, other buildings and structures. They could break it down into other buildings versus the structures, but uh, and but there is not much more detail beyond that uh, to, to, to have, for example, data on uh, roads, on, on uh, railways, etc. So uh, that's that's one of the goals that we we try to get more details. Uh, we we will do this uh, exercise again, and hopefully uh, countries also can supply data where they feel perhaps less confident about the quality, but, but which is still useful uh, for analysis. The third line of work is uh, that's related to, to, uh, to a project of the International Transport Forum, and they are in the process of developing transport satellite accounts. So, so satellite accounts uh, uh, which are closely uh, aligned to uh, national accounts, but focus on all uh, types of uh, transport related uh, issues. That's actually what I wanted to, to tell you. Uh, and I thank you for your attention and questions and answers. Please, please raise them. And uh, I try to answer them. If I cannot do it directly, I, we, we can still do it uh, by written exchange. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that, Peter. Uh, we have a question from Sanjiv, please. Sanjiv Mahajan. Just checking, can you hear me, Mary Yes, I Yes, I can. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the presentation, Peter. Hopefully you can hear me as well. Um, I think this is a really interesting area, for sure. Um, obviously, we have issues like future productive capacity, sustainability, the contribution to life standards, uh, distribution across regions, etc. A lot of issues in policy links here. I mean, I remember seeing a program where China in nine years had built enough rail infrastructure to join Peking and London, which is phenomenal. So there's a lot of activity going on around the world. Um, but where I was coming back to was the definition and the flexibility stroke future proofing. So obviously the tangible side is probably a lot easier and it's easier to identify who the producers are as well as the users. So there's benefits to the users, but it's more on how do you future proof your definition for intangibles like the cloud. You mentioned IT systems. We've got IT systems now where doctors do not want to see the patients. They provide advice, etc. Uh, over the internet, so they've used uh, developed systems. These systems will last longer than a year, but not necessarily get capitalized in a national accounting sense. So where I'm coming from is tangible and intangible. How will you go about trying to future-proof the definition as new activities come along, which don't look like the traditional infrastructure, but are providing an infrastructure to support services for producers to provide and enable services for users, like particularly households? Yeah, a very good question, as usual, uh, uh, for, for Sanchi. Uh, I guess it starts starts with, with the definition of what you want uh, to include and to exclude. Personally, uh, as I said, uh, I think it's important uh, to, to, to be, have a rather broad view on, on what to include from, from an IT uh, perspective. Um, I must admit, I, I haven't thought about uh, what exactly you consider as, as uh, uh, infrastructure in, in, in IT, but clearly all, all the, the underlying, uh, I, I would say, tangible assets for, for making it possible to have internet, to, uh, to have communication, to have uh, sharing of data, et cetera, qualify uh, for uh, inclusion. Uh, intangible, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say it's less tangible and more difficult to, 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 to define what exactly you would, would include. Uh, uh, I take the example of uh, where we have a lot of discussion now on data. 
is 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 all the building up of this uh, data. Would you consider that as as infrastructure or not? Pro probably, yeah. You 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 better be on on the on the safe side, and and have a rather broad definition, but also have uh, breakdowns when it comes to uh, data collection. Uh, to have breakdowns to uh, narrow the, the, the definition down if if wanted. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. Do we have any other questions? I can't see any other in the Q&A uh, section. Okay, as I'm not seeing any other questions, I think we can proceed to the next session. The next presentation is by Martin van Brossen. Uh, he's from Statistics Netherlands, and he's going to be talking to us about the value added of infrastructure. He'll be presenting an explanatory uh, study, and we will be very interested to hear about what the value is that it adds to the Dutch economy. Okay, Martin. Thank you, Marianti. Um, I will try to share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yes, indeed we can. Ah, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Martin van Rossum. Uh, I work at Statistics Netherlands. I have uh, the honor to present our research on value added of infrastructure. Uh, this research has been financed by Next Generation Infra. Uh, we executed uh, two studies, and one published in 2018 and one published in 2019. Uh, one study is on um, the value of infra in the Dutch economy only. And one study is uh, published in 2019 and is uh, an international comparison. We try to compile international figures on value added of infrastructure for a lot of different countries. Uh, this presentation is a short combined summary of both uh, studies. Uh, the result uh, I present today are still experimental and are very much open to debate. Uh, the explorative studies can be seen as a first step in estimating the value added of infrastructure. There's still a lot of um, room for improvement, so feedback, ideas and suggestions for improvement are very welcome. Setting the scene, uh, I start with a few uh, in introduction slides in order to summarize the studies executed. Later on, I will zoom in and touch upon the precise definition, the scope, the method, the results, the limits, the cautions, the conclusions, and the recommendations. Okay, um, yeah, important question. What value does a road add to the D Dutch economy? And what is the value added of a waterway or e electricity network? And why is it interesting to quantify um, this and to monitor this? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of uh, money is uh, invested in uh, infrastructure projects and it's um, um, interesting to uh, quantify what the rate on return is of these uh, investments. Um, so in an exploratory study, uh, which is funded by the Knowledge Centrum NG Infra, uh, Statistics Netherlands has made an estimate of value added of infrastructure for the period uh, 1995 until 2016. 
And in the first study, we uh, only uh, quantified the value added of uh, infrastructure for the Dutch economy. But yeah, it's very uh, difficult to interpret uh, this one number. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, what does it say? Is it uh, a large number? Is it a small number? Who knows? So it's uh, important to place uh, the results for the Dutch economy in an international context. And this we did in our second study. In these studies, uh, infrastructure does not only concern roads, uh, railway lines and pipelines, but also things like uh, fluid risk management, information and telecommunication facilities, as well as the transport of the people and the goods. Uh, so infrastructure consists of all basic facilities that are essential for the functioning of society and the economy. So the figure for value added of infrastructure presented in this study should be seen as a first experimental narrow estimate of the magnitude of the contribution of infrastructure to the Dutch economy. And for 2016, this estimate uh, equals to more than uh, 73 billion euros, which is almost equal to 12% uh, of total value added. In 1995, and the value added of infrastructure equaled 39 billion. So in more than 20 years, the value added has almost doubled. Uh, some uh, caution, these uh, mentioned figures have uh, not been adjusted for price changes over time. And another caution, uh, be aware because um, mineral extraction is uh, part of the infrastructure sector and especially this activity is quite sensitive to price and uh, volume changes. So here, uh, the key indicator for the Netherlands, what is the contribution of infrastructure to the Dutch economy? Uh, one indicator, uh, including uh, the mining and aquarium, and one indicator, uh, excluding the mining and aquarium. You can see that uh, the contribution uh, is uh, relatively stable over time. Um, excluding the mining and the extraction, uh, it's even more stable of time and more or less equal to 10% uh, in 2060, which was also the case in 1995. Okay, that's it for the introduction. Uh, now I will zoom and in and touch upon uh, not a precise uh, definition, the scope, the method, results, some reflections, uh, some limits of the study, uh, some cautions, conclusions, and recommendations. So what is measured in this study? Value added of activities in the exploitation phase and in the non-exploitation phase of the infrastructure sector. Uh, what do we mean by this? Uh, we value the economic contribution of those industries that are part of the production and supply chains of primary services of infrastructures. So again, what are primary services? We include in this study fluid safety and water level management, the energy supply, information and tele telecommunications, transport of people and goods, drinking water supply, and last but not least, waste removal and processing. Um, in this study, we uh, quantified um, two different phases. Firstly, the exploitation phase. In the exploitation phase, value added is generated by operators using the existing infrastructure. We also compiled figures for the so-called non-exploitation phase or investment phase. And uh, in this phase, we quantified the value added generated by the producers of the investments done in infrastructure. 
very often uh, the industry construction. So in this study, value added of infrastructure has been calculated by summing up the value added of all the activities directly related to the operation of the infrastructure. So this includes the extraction of natural gas, the transport of goods, and the management and the distribution of, for example, gas, water, light, and the internet. In addition to operating the infrastructure, value added is also generated by uh, investing in the new infrastructure. After all, the construction of new roads and networks also adds value and also contributes to GDP. These earnings are included in the totals of value added of infrastructure. So how did we do this in practice? Which activities did we select as being relevant? The following industries are considered in this study. We included mining and querying. We included the manufacturing of coke and petroleum, and we only include the fuels, not the chemical parts. Uh, we include uh, energy supply, production, transmission, distribution. Uh, we included retail and wholesale of fuels. We included water collection and distribution. We included sewerage and waste treatment. We included land, water, and air transport, telecom telecommunications, information service activities, and public administration and government services. Um, and for most of these activities, there are uh, NACE classes available and statistics available for value added. So basically we applied uh, quite uh, a simple method uh, to quantify value added numbers for these different um, activities. Uh, the expectation phase is uh, very often directly based on information of the supply and use tables, which are available in the national accounts. Uh, and for some activities, we are only interested in the share of a corresponding two-digit um, uh, NACE class and uh, in order to um, uh, split a two-digit uh, activity, we applied a formula which is uh, based on the production. For example, uh, retail of fuels, uh, there's no specific NACE class for retail of fuels only. Uh, gas stations uh, sell also uh, drinks and food and uh, cigarettes and other stuff. And you can correct for these sales which are not relevant for infrastructure. And based on supplementary information, we can estimate uh, the relevant part of this industry, the relevant uh, margins and based on uh, the distribution of margins, we can uh, estimate the value added which is uh, uh, um, relevant for this study. And for the non expectation phase, um, we uh, use uh, especially data on total investments. Uh, data on total investments is really the driver for this uh, activity. Uh, we use uh, data on uh, investments in civil engineering of um, the industries we included uh, in the study, which I mentioned uh, earlier. And <clears throat> um, we know uh, the value added per unit production of uh, the construction industry. We can uh, compute this ratio and this ratio can be uh, multiplied with uh, total investments uh, in basic prices. And then you can uh, estimate the value added which is related to those investments, which is generated by the construction industry. Okay, um, yeah, this uh, value added uh, can be delineated into a uh, few uh, components um, like uh, consumption, compensation of employees, uh, the gross operating surplus and the balance of non 
product related taxes and subsidies. Why did we do this? Now, it facilitates more useful interpretation of the figures. Um, especially, yeah, for example, how are the factors in production rewarded? Uh, the cap is it the capital intensive uh, sector or more labor intensive sector or uh, something else? Okay, then I'll go to the results. Uh, this uh, graph has been presented uh, earlier. Um, now you can see that the share or the contribution of infrastructure over time to GDP is rather stable. Excluding mining and querying is um, slightly more than 10% and including um, Mining and querying is something um, like 11.4% uh, in 2016. Um, now you can uh, decompose the total value added of, of infrastructure. Uh, here it's done for the year 2016. And we have done it for the infrastructure sector, but also for the Dutch economy as a whole. Um, seems to be that the uh, infrastructure activities are more capital intensive than the rest of the economy, uh, which uh, I think will not be a surprise for most of you. Uh, also, the amount of subsidies is relatively high in the infrastructure sector. This is because a few um, transport over land activities are subsidized uh, to ensure or facilitate access to all or most. So, um, relatively speaking, uh, the infrastructure sector receives more subsidies than the Dutch economy on average. Here you can see a time series for value added for um, the infrastructure sector. And uh, you can see uh, the difference between the expectation phase and the non expectation phase. Most value added is created uh, by using the existing infrastructure, so by the expectation phase. Uh, this is because many of today's roads, waterways and other networks have already been built in the past and the vast majority of the added value consists of uh, the use of existing infrastructure. Um, yeah, in total 73 billion is uh, created and 69 billion is due to the uh, expectation of ex existing infrastructure. This uh, equals uh, almost 95% of the total and the remaining 4 billion euros is generated by the construction of new infrastructure. Um, and you can see that uh, the relationship uh, between expectation phase and non expectation phase is uh, quite uh, stable over time. It has not changed that much over time. So, which uh, industries are um, relatively speaking, important for the infrastructure sector. Uh, you can see that uh, public administration and government services are uh, very, is a very important activity in the infrastructure sector. Um, yeah, there's a lot of consumption of fixed capital. Uh, for example, roads, uh, waterways, uh, railway lines, etc. And this is attributed to public administration. And of course, uh, public administration uh, also invests a lot in new uh, um, inf uh, infrastructure. And uh, this uh, attributed uh, value added is also. Um, attributed to this particular industry. Uh, you can see that warehousing and services for transport are also uh, quite relevant uh, in this sector. 
land transport, energy supply, telecommunications, mining, air transport, and some um, other activities are, uh, do not have a particular large share in uh, the total value added of infrastructure. For example, retail and wholesale of fuels has only a minor uh, share in the total. So, uh, we also uh, compiled figures for different countries uh, in order to uh, put our uh, number on value added for the Dutch economy into international perspective. Um, yeah, the contribution of infrastructure to GDP is, is 10%, 2016. Um, and this is more or less comparable to other European countries. Uh, you can see that Norway is an uh, outlier with almost 25%. And this is mainly attributable to uh, mineral extraction. Uh, as you know, Norway has a lot of uh, oil and gas reserves and they, attract, they extract every year a lot and they uh, generate a lot of value added with it. Uh, the, the question is, yeah, do you want to have a big contribution of infrastructure to GDP or, or small contribution to GDP? Uh, and yeah, this is really a difficult question, I think. Uh, this is, in my view, still open to discussion. Of course, you need a certain base level of infrastructure activities in order to have a well-functioning economy. But um, yeah, you can question if a too dominant infrastructure sector is desirable. Uh, maybe not. Uh, infrastructure is a means to an end. It should facilitate other uh, economic activities. So a big or a too big share says um, yeah, also something about the magnitude of other uh, relevant activities. So you really have to be careful in uh, comparing uh, only GDP shares in between countries. Um, you can also uh, compare value added per, uh, per inhabitant or per capita or uh, based on the, uh, on the surface uh, uh, of a country. Um, uh, then the value added of the infrastructure in the Netherlands is actually quite high compared to other European countries. Um, here, the Netherlands is uh, in the middle. If you uh, compare it to total GDP, but if you um, uh, show this uh, graph, value added of infrastructure per capita, we, uh, as the Netherlands, uh, are uh, in the in the top three of countries. Um, we also um, made this uh, picture. Uh, you can um, show a distribution for every country for all activities uh, included in the infrastructural uh, sector. And here you can see that, yeah, some activities are really, really dominant in uh, certain uh, countries. As mentioned, Norway has a big mining and extraction industry, which is very dominant in their infrastructure sector, which is also uh, the case in, uh, in Canada and the um, and, and United States and, and also in the Netherlands still a lot of uh, gas and oil is, is extracted. But here you can see differences in between countries of uh, the contribution of different uh, industries to the uh, value added of infrastructure. Uh, so we made a lot of um, uh, value added numbers for a lot of different uh, countries. Uh, but yeah, this is a really, really a challenge. Uh, from a data ability point of view, it's really... Uh, you have four minutes. Yes. Really complicated to uh, make time series. 
Um, yeah, sometimes there's sometimes there is necessary. Uh, yeah, do not have the source data available. Uh, sometimes uh, you miss details in data. Um, yeah, it, that that's that's a pity, and, and that's uh, that that is uh, really a challenge. And you have to be creative to construct uh, the missing parts. Uh, Sometimes uh, we also adapted the concept uh, because uh, comparability, comparability is more important than the perfect uh, picture. Uh, so therefore you are a little bit dependent on, uh, on the weakest link and uh, you have to make some assumptions in order uh, to compare the infrastructure sector in between countries. So some reflections, international analysis does provide a first preliminary insight in differences in value added generated by infrastructural activities in different countries. Uh, why did we do this? To put the Dutch results into international perspective, not to show that one country does better than the other one. Uh, this should be taken into account in interpreting the results. Explaining differences is still very difficult. Uh, differences in the structure of the economy play a role, but also the impact of nature um, plays a big role. Uh, are you an island? Are there a lot of mountains in your country? Uh, is there a lot of water in your country? Etc. Etc. So be aware there are differences between the international method applied and the Dutch method applied. Um, but still, uh, we think that for the period 2001, 2016, we were able to uh, construct a real, uh, of quite a real uh, consistent time series for most countries, which is of course not a perfect series. Uh, now this study quantifies what a country earns in expectation and non expectation phase uh, using the definitions of the national accounts framework. It does not estimate the size of the capital services of infrastructure. It's more than that, but not, but not necessarily better. Um, it's different. Um, the study quantifies only the direct effects. Indirect effects are not included. And this study does not provide information on, and does not value the long-term effects of changes in infrastructure. And uh, we do not take into account consumer surplus. Recommendations. Uh, we only looked at uh, value added in current prices. It might also be interesting to look at value added in fixed price levels. Uh, try to estimate figures for a longer time series as many investments in infrastructure took place before 1995. Maybe the, the non-expectation phase or the investment phase is quite large in 1960 or 1970. Um, include multiplier analysis and develop indicators on the environment and input use and still try to improve the interpretation of the results. Thank you very much and the research we did can be found uh, using this link. Thank you very much and now I stop sharing. Are there any questions? Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have one question from Sanju Mahajan. Just double checking, Marianne. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, there's lots of ifs, buts, lots of questions. Obviously, I'm not going to ask lots, but I think you're right to say on the policy link, um, to what degree you have a policy driver that drives the investment in infrastructure. And that depends on the government's view on the future productive potential, output gap, employment, regions, et cetera. So in a sense, it's very difficult for your study to sort of like make those recommendations. However, in your way forward, you've caveated in a way one or two of the things I wanted to raise. So the focus in a sense of the analysis is within the national accounts frame. And I think here, we could, because it's analytical, go a bit beyond. 
So the cost of production of these infrastructure assets is something we can focus on. We know who these producers are. But the cost of using or consumption is slightly different, especially if there's no transaction. So where I'm coming from is, let's say, for example, we build a new dam or a new bridge over a river. And that allows a town or a city to have better links, uh, including business activities they may be production products being bought and sold and they transport using a much easier route but there's no payment for the use of that bridge on the other hand there may be a toll now where there's a toll you can actually have a market value in some sort of rent uh, interpretation but it's it would be very interesting to go beyond the national accounts frame to start to say well actually we know what the value added is in the national accounting frame but beyond that there's a lot of benefits for society, whether it's business or households, of the use of that bridge, instead of going another 20 kilometers down the river to go across the bridge, they've got this bridge. This infrastructure will last a long time. And then the second, and to my point there will be any thoughts on how you could do that. And my second point would be, whatever the definition, and I like your openness and transparency of what you included. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily agree with all of them, but that's a separate issue. But the definition you have if you could generate a balance sheet of the relevant assets that have been produced you could then generate in information on like future capital services future rent flows now some of those may not well be captured in the national accounts that's not a good thing or a bad thing but it's information giving you a much more collective picture so there's just a couple of ideas and questions of what your thoughts are on that Mariante, Peter speaking can I uh raise a related question. I see I cannot uh, put this, something in the questions and answers box. Yes, of course. I think we can take a few questions and then perhaps Martin can uh, respond to them collectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, for, for me, it's slight, slightly related to what Sanchev uh, raised, but I take a different angle. Uh, Personally, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious, and I, I was a member of the advisory committee uh, of this project, and I raised this point as well. I was uh, very uh, uh, surprised about this focus on value added. And uh, uh, not only that, it seems that, that one of the goals uh, of, of uh, the project was to have a big number, a big share in value added. It, it always reminds me of uh, thematic uh, satellite accounts. So we are on various themes on tourism, uh, who knows what. If you would, if a country would add, would compile these, all these satell uh, thematic satellite accounts, probably you would arrive at 350% of GDP. Uh, so, but coming back, I, I I wonder about this focus on value add. If, if I think of infrastructure, I think mainly of the non-exploitation phase, as you call it, and then especially looking at investments, and capital stocks, and maintenance of this uh, uh, of these activities in the non-exploitation phase. For me, it's another question: what use? is being made of uh, this infrastructure. How efficient, how effective is this uh, capital stock uh, on infrastructure? And then it's, it's useful uh, to look at the use that is being made of infrastructure, of the various types of infrastructure. But uh, that's not only, you, you can express that in terms of the output generated directly related to the use of infrastructure or the value added, but probably it's even more important to look at physical indicators. And that's much related to, to what Sanchev said, you have to go also beyond uh, national accounts. If you look at the, 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 uh, the use of the roads, how, effect, how effective and efficient they are, you may have to look at uh, uh, the number of person kilometers and uh, mass uh, ton uh, kilometers uh, that is going uh, over roads or through waterways, etc. So, uh, I, 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 I would love to see that that the the the, the 
questions, the policy questions are, I think, in that field, not necessarily on how big uh, infrastructure is, because that, that definition, I have several questions on it, but uh, okay, I'll stop here, thanks. Are there any other questions? Uh, perhaps it might be worthwhile taking the questions now and then Martin can give us a collective response at the end. Martin, I'm not seeing any more questions. So if you'd like to take these two, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marianti. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your questions. I will try to uh, give uh, some uh, answers and uh, reflections um, on these questions. Uh, yes, we uh, included only um, direct effects of uh, yeah, the industries we selected and indirect effects of uh, better infrastructure are, are not uh, included in this uh, study, which, uh, which uh, is, a, is a pity. Uh, I would like to quantify uh, those indirect effects uh, as well, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's quite, uh, quite complicated. Uh, you want to know uh, yeah, how the extra investment has led to more productivity in uh, the non-selected industries as well because uh, yeah infrastructure is a public good and uh, it can uh, enlarge productivity in all uh, industries uh, of a country um, also in services industry and in uh, other manufacturing sectors which have not been uh, included in this uh, in the study but um, yeah, maybe uh, value chain uh, methods can be applied to uh, estimate those kind of uh, numbers. But um, I, I have not a, a, a solution uh, to your question, but uh, I, I agree it's important to have a more uh, uh, broad uh, view on this as well. Um, Another question of Sanjeev on, um, on, on the asset values. Uh, I agree, uh, it would be very useful to have um, the balance sheets of uh, the relevant uh, infrastructure in, in the Netherlands. And uh, it was also one of our uh, recommendations uh, in the study to uh, compile uh, these kind of uh, asset values and based on these uh, asset values, you can uh, estimate uh, the capital services uh, which are related to those uh, assets, uh, which uh, I think uh, is a very um, useful extra uh, analysis uh, for, this, uh, for this field. Um, then uh, the question of, of Peter, um, the, the focus on, on, on the one number for value added. Um, um, yeah, um, I think uh, you need a set of indicators um, for, for infrastructure in order to say um, something about the sector in general and not only uh, one number on value added. Uh, like you said, uh, physical information on kilos and kilometers, uh, the environmental pressure uh, of the industries involved, uh, a lot more uh, non-economic information is also uh, very relevant in order to have uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this sector. So I agree. Do not focus on value added only, uh, focus on more uh, variables and indicators. Um, Martin, I'm going to have to ask you to, to wrap it up a little bit because we are, uh, given the time that we have, to uh, find the sound session as well, if that's all right. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think uh, I answered uh, most questions, so uh, I keep it up. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. If there's any additional questions, obviously we can contact the, the uh, presenters directly and, and follow the questions up to make sure everybody's had the opportunity to, to raise their points. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Martin. I would thank you. like to uh, move on to the final presenter of this session, which is Sam Agri. Uh, Sam will be presenting from the National Infrastructure Commission in the UK. He will be talking to us about the performance measures that they have that they do on measuring infrastructure uh, and the framework that they've designed and how these are used to measure their objectives and the widely developments that they have in store. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thanks, Marianthi. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Is that visible to everyone? Yes, we can see that, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Agri um, from National Judge Commission, and today we're presenting some work we've done to develop a framework for measuring infrastructure performance. So, a brief outline of the presentation. First, I'm going to give a little brief on who we are, what we do, what our objectives are, to kind of put the work that we've done performance measures into some wider context. Then, go into a little bit about how we actually developed the measures and then what's actually in it and how they directly explicitly link to our, our objectives of infrastructure and, and the kind of outputs of work that they support, and as well as any sort of specific areas where we've kind of gone away and um, tried to fill gaps that existed within the framework. So the UK National Infrastructure Commission was set up in October 2015, if I recall correctly, to provide the government with impartial expert advice on major long-term infrastructure challenges. So we're an independent body, non-statutory, with eight expert commissioners who provide input and advice into the, the, the range of recommendations that we make to government on long-term infrastructure. So in terms of the infrastructure policy sort of space world, we're separate from a body like the Infrastructure and Projects Authority who deal with um, issues regarding project delivery. So in terms of our scope and objectives, we have three main objectives that all our work has to align to and, and, and support um, relating to infrastructure. So those are supporting sustainable economic growth across all regions in the UK, improving competitiveness and improving quality of life. And in terms of the outputs that we actually produce, uh, the main piece of work that we, we have to report to government is a national infrastructure assessment that takes place once every five years, and which is a long-term infrastructure plan that spans across a 30-year period um, across all of economic infrastructure. This happens once every five years with the last one in 2018 and the next one due in 2023. We also conduct more in-depth studies on infrastructure, which uses these, these performance frameworks or parts of it that looks at specific issues in specific sectors. So, for example, we've recently published something looking at, at the energy sector and the kind of cost requirements um, and the capacity requirements that you need in that sector to deliver net zero targets um, in, a lot, in line with CCC's um, work. And lastly, we have an annual monitor report that we publish yearly to try and really hold government to account and make sure that they're hopefully following through with the things that we, we recommend them to and see how progress is with, with those. So now into the meat of the presentation, why performance measures? So from our kind of, once we kind of were set up and we started to kind of look into the different issues that existed within sort of the infrastructure policy space, we realized that there was a heavy focus on investment. So on the right, you can see investment in inland transport um, it, as a percentage of GDP across a range of different countries. And though that this is really useful because I guess investment is is a really good thing that you can focus on to understand how well a country's doing on, on in terms of infrastructure, because it, it, it will most likely 
denote some sort of quality or some sort of improvement over time. But I think the problem with kind of only focusing on that, as I think others have referenced through in the other two presentations, is that investment is ultimately only an input to what truly matters, which is the quality of infrastructure services and how users experience it and how it supports um, their lives. And it also supports the wider economic activity. So it's essentially an enabler. So to capture that sort of more indirect sort of um, impact of infrastructure, we decided to broaden this horizon that doesn't just focus on investment and focuses, focuses on things like quality of life, uh, on impacts uh, on natural capital from infrastructure so that we can essentially measure consistently over time and monitor the progress of infrastructure and basically have a have a framework in place that every time for example the government tell us to um, look into something in the transport sector we at least have a basis that we can start to assess the issues and assess performance before making recommendations as to what should happen over the long term so that was mainly our rationale for developing it. In, in order to essentially make sure that they were practical and that we could actually use it, we came up with a set of requirements. So these are all quite intuitive and straightforward. They should be quantifiable. So we should be able to play some sort of numerical, hopefully some quantitative um, values towards any sort of measure or metric that we have so we can feed into our work. And one other key one is the ability to compare across different sectors, across different regions and countries. So in terms of the sectoral thing, we might not have, for instance, the same kind of measure or methodology to understand, for instance, reliability, um, which might be something that we care about in transport and energy, but they should be able to tell us the same thing. They should be able to tell us the same story of what is reliability in those sectors. So that comparison point is very important. And also, as we kind of use this on an ongoing basis, we needed them to be a small amount so we can update them um, and, and maintain them much easier. So a little bit about the timeline for developing them. The, the main thing to point out in this timeline is there was a lot of stakeholder engagement and working with the different um, experts, whether it's across government or academia, across these sectors to identify the correct measures that we should consider when looking at that wider horizon of things that you should think about when you measure infrastructure performance. So the main points were in spring 2017 where we commissioned JBA Consulting to identify an initial set of performance measures. And then we went through an iterative process of consultation in a report that we published um, called Congestion Capacity Carbon that um, asked for feedback on, on the measures. And then they were underwent further development and discussion with government departments, which led to the publication of three main pieces of work. So the initial set done by JBA Consulting and then a transport connectivity discussion paper, which I'll talk about later, which looked at one specific sector and one specific kind of um, domain of, of performance where we develop methodology to understand this. And then we published a technical annex, which went through the whole methodology of and the rationale behind performance measures, as well as publishing the data that supported this. So now I'm going to actually go into what is in the, 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 the framework and give a brief overview of, of, of each different domain. So we've categorized them by domains of infrastructure performance so as a way to organize this. So the first one, volume of consumption, is very much always debated. And I think my first exposure to this was that this isn't really performance. But when, you, when I kind of thought about it a bit more, this measure is mainly in there primarily for scaling and context. So on its own, it might not tell you about performance, but if you combine it with other things within this framework, it might do. So as a very basic example, if you take energy consumption and if you keep everything constant, you don't sort of, yeah, energy consumption is rising over time. That should tell you that that's most likely going to have an impact on the environment domain. So it might have an impact on emissions um, or environment, environmental externalities. And also if you look at cost, cost increases 
um, themselves might not really tell you the full story. But if you combine cost increases in a sector where um, cost is dependent on consumption, then understanding the consumption and activity levels in the sectors can really um, provide you to understand the, the changes in cost. So that's what the volume of consumption domain it's there for. The next one is resilience. And here we kind of think about it in two different spheres. So we think about it in resilience to large shocks and everyday resilience. But at its core, resilience is about capturing the ability of infrastructure to continue to function effectively in the face of future challenges. So in terms of the resilience to large shock measure, this is about more large scale system wide impacts that are normally low probability and high impact. So over there, we want to understand how the infrastructure system, whether interconnected or um, individual systems, how do they react to increased um, increased or exog exogenous shocks, essentially. So if there's an increase in, in demand that's unexpected, is the system able to still deliver the level of service? Or if it were to fail, how quickly is it going to bounce back? And then everyday resilience is more about more localized, smaller scale um, things that occur on a more regular basis. The next domain is quality. And again, we look at this from two separate angles. So firstly, we care about, about the service quality. So we care about measures that denote how good the service is. So for example, in transport, one uh, measure that we've developed is transport connectivity. So that just tells you how easy it is it for people to get around within places and between places across different modes of, of, of transport. But we also care about user experience of finding infrastructure services, because as we know, what is reported, um, for instance, in energy and water by regulators on the metrics that they have for service quality can be very different from what users experience for a variety of reasons I won't go into. But I thought, but we thought it was important important here to capture those two to have a more holistic um, view of what quality is, both from the more objective um, reporting process stuff and also from the user experience. The next domain is about cost. So trying to understand the affordability of infrastructure services to households and, and businesses, as well as the, the public sector. And then we have environments, which looks at the impact of infrastructure on the environment. And this as well is split into three different categories where we look at the impact on emissions. So more aggregate level um, emissions data across the different sectors. Um, and also things like environmental externalities and the impact of infrastructure on the natural um, environment and also how much infrastructure relies on the natural environment to um, provide services. Lastly is efficiency and efficiency is very much linked to the quality domain because efficiency is about how well can these systems use their resources to deliver services. And normally, if the system isn't very good at doing that, the quality is going to be much, much lower. Um, so just to actually point out what actually sits in each of these different domains and what kind of data that we look at. So volume consumption, very much a, a scaling measure. And we have things like the passenger um, kilometers traveled by people and also the ton of goods that are, are transported, as well as the number number of trips. And in energy and water, we have energy consumption um, and, and water consumed as well, as well as more normalized measures of these, because we don't just want to look at the absolute energy consumption levels. We want to actually compare it to um, scale it in context to changes in population and household sizes and stuff like that. And on resilience, like I said, we have two different ways that we look at it, resilience to large shocks and everyday resilience. And the resilience to large shocks, as you can see by the key um, below, is the one area that we haven't been able to yet really look at and develop measures to accurately understand this. So we recently published a resilience report which looked at um, issues around resilience across the sectors. And one thing that we recommended was the need for the different uh, sectors to develop more stress testing 
and hopefully have more measures that we can actually understand if the system is pushed to um, the brinks of it is essentially pushed pushed towards the highest level of capacity that it can actually um, supply these serv ser services, how is it able to cope? So that's one area that we, we really do need to develop and happy to welcome any thoughts on that. And more everyday resilience are things like travel time reliability, um, number of properties that are flooded, and time that properties lose access to energy. So they're much more smaller scale things you that. Sorry? You have five minutes. Thank you. Much more localized um, impact. So in quality, again, we have things like connectivity and then the quality of user experience. These are denoted by a range of different surveys across the sectors asking people um, how good is your water supply, how reliable is your, your, your uh, energy, your electricity and gas, gas networks. And on cost, very much trying to capture the cost per unit consumed, um, things like the passenger cost per passenger traveled and also tum um, transported and on the environment again is split into three different ways to look at it so emissions uh, aggregate emissions across the different sectors but then the breakdown of each one and how those compare to total emissions um, greenhouse gas emissions um, in absolute sense and natural capital is another area that a lot of work needs to be done to develop more concrete measures to understand the interaction between infrastructure and the natural environment. And on system efficiency, again, uh, just to pick out leakages, you know, the system efficiency uh, of a network is most likely to actually affect the quality as well. So high level of leakages might actually affect the ability to, to, to deliver water services as well. And just to show how these genuinely map across our objectives. So as I said before, we have three different um, key objectives that we make sure that our work moves towards. And this kind of shows that all of these different domains do across the different objectives meet that. Um, so obviously things like resilience to large shocks, large scale shocks are more likely to go into effect um, economic activity and also quality of life. So it's just about showing how we've mapped these across our different objectives. So what did we not include? We didn't include things like project delivery measures, because again, this is mostly in the IPA territory, infrastructure projects and authority territory. Um, and we've also found it very difficult to measure the impact of infrastructure on GDP consistently. So there isn't anything that's, that tries to um, show more clearly how increases in investment actually impact the economy through infrastructure. Um, and things like safety are very much captured in some way in quality because normally when they ask these surveys, they do ask questions that denote to safety. So as I said, the main gaps are in design quality, natural capital, and also um, the, the resilience one in terms of the stress testing. And again, we established an infrastructure design group that's not really looking at developing measures for that, but it's looking more widely about how you understand design um, across infrastructure, how you can improve it and how you monitor it over time, which should hopefully help us when we um, consider this, this framework. So one of the gaps that we've had managed to fill is transport connectivity. So we've been able to conduct a piece of work to understand how easy it is for people to get around in the UK, in the thousand most built up areas in the UK, which brought us to having three measures. So intra-urban connectivity within urban areas and then inter-urban connectivity um, between towns and cities. And this is across different um, modes of transport. And we managed to publish this set of results and also feed it into a uh, wider set of recommendations we made to government on urban transport using this work uh, as, as, main, as the main evidence base for that. And this is kind of showing the kind of findings from it. And we tried to capture the impact of population size and how that affects the different connectivity scores across um, transport modes and across peak and, and off peak travel times. 
So I won't go into this one more detailed in, in as I'm running out of time, but there is a discussion paper that um, we definitely encourage people to go and read on that and also to explore the wider um, the wider performance data and the performance measures. We are planning later in the year in, in, in autumn to actually publish a more interactive set of these performance measures, allowing users to have like a really good cross-sectoral view of performance of infrastructure across different sectors. I think that's the real value added in that like you can obviously go to DFT and, and, and BASE to understand energy and transport, but having a more having it all in one place where you can really compare the different sectors and how they do within this framework. I think it's a real good value added. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation and happy to take on any questions. Thank you very much for that, Sam. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A section. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Perhaps I can raise a question. Uh, Peter speaking here, Mariante. Yes, Peter, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I like your approach very much, the approach of the UK owners. And it's more online with my, my uh, remarks in relation to the Dutch presentation. I think this, this these are the questions uh, you want to, 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 to answer. I was wondering uh, when, when defining infrastructure, uh, you seem to perhaps uh, uh, you seem to focus on the traditional infrastructure, or perhaps I, I, I listened not that good, but I was wondering about IT communications type of infrastructure. Uh, do you deal with that as well, or do you intend to deal with that as well? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So in terms of defining it, we, we generally do follow, I think, what, what the OCD um, have under their room for infrastructure and also what the ONS has. So economic infrastructure covers the main sectors of energy, um, transport, solid waste management, flood risk management, um, as well as digital. So, yes, we do consider things like IT infrastructure as well within within our remit. So, yeah, we, we, we haven't sort of... Um, fully def defined um, the extent and the detail that that goes into, but we do follow um, quite well, for instance, how the ONS have defined and how they measure infrastructure as well. Thank you, uh, Sam and Peter. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, then I would like to close the session. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Peter, Martin and Sam for the very informative presentations. We heard from the uh, wider perspective of the global side, uh, the international work from Peter, the importance of defining infrastructure uh, and, and finding a common definition and the challenges linked to it across the countries and their work on collecting available national data and their work on enhancing the satellite accounts. Uh, from Martin, uh, we heard a more national perspective on the uh, value of infrastructure uh, in the Netherlands, uh, how uh, the various industries that contribute to it and how this compares with other countries. Of course, not bringing the challenges as well that are posed by uh, the very good question on whether we should be looking at percentages of GDP and whether a large or a small percentage of GDP is uh, uh, adequate as a measure of infrastructure. Then there was the discussion with the audience on the realized benefits of infrastructure. There was a lot of emphasis on value added. Should we be looking at use? And of course, the challenge of measuring that use when there are no direct payments. And then uh, we heard from Sam uh, from the commission on uh, look where they look at infrastructure as uh, an enabler rather than the investment that goes into it. And 
what is the experience that it provides to users, uh, looking at additional uh, domains on resilience, user experience, and even the environment. And from a more practical perspective, the, we saw how these estimates could be used to estimate uh, tra local transport connectivity. So thank you very much to the audience. I would also like to say a thank you to Josh Martin, who is my predecessor and actually put quite a lot of work in organizing this session and to the audience. I see there's one more question there. Um, there's coming from Richard Hayes. So I will, uh, Richard, I will, could you ask your questions very quickly? <laughs> ah, thank you. Um, yes, Richard Hayes, ONS. Um, so we obviously publish infrastructure statistics. I really just wanted to ask the last speaker, is there any way in which uh, they would, he would want them improved or changed? Um, thanks. thanks, Richard. Yeah, um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question. So I think, so far, the ONS um, focus on publishing infrastructure stats has been uh, focused on the sort of capital stock, um, the investments, and then going into very detail about how that's split between public and private. Um, but as you kind of saw in my presentation, we've kind of uh, expanded this a little bit beyond investment. But I'm not sure whether those other bits like resilience or, or, or environment and all those other bits really fit within the ONS's um, sort of infrastructure remit. But if there was kind of um, scope, if it would be good if we could have like more specific measures that cover those other, those other parts of the domain that I went through. Um, right, yo, but, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's continue talking about that. Thank you. Yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. And that takes us up to the end of the session.